Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Leatherface, which came out in 2017, not 2018, like I mistakenly said in the first Kill Count of this franchise. Leatherface is the last stop on our Texas Chainsaw Meat Train, even though chronologically, it would be the first movie. In case you forgot, this film is a prequel to the original 1974 film, but exists in the same continuity as the 3D one we just went through. Again, that means we're ignoring parts 2 through 4 and the remake timeline, and instead we'll be dealing with characters like Verna Sawyer, the matriarch of the Sawyer family, who was played by Marilyn Burns in Chainsaw 3D, but is now played by The Conjuring's Lily Taylor. Much like Texas Chainsaw 3D, Leatherface is more narratively driven than any of the other films in the franchise. In fact, this period picture about a group of young asylum patients on the run feels more like a Terrence Malick flick than a Texas Chainsaw movie. Maybe it's because of how international it is. Here we have a pair of French dudes directing a cast of young English actors in a movie that they shot in Bulgaria. We've certainly come a long way from the homespun, gritty, Texan-made film that kicked this series off in the first place. Will this fancy pants film deliver a high body count, or is it just putting lipstick on a pig in the slaughterhouse? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins on the Sawyer Farm, found in 1845. It's Jedediah Sawyer's birthday, and he's got his whole family here to help him celebrate. Mother Verna, brothers Drayton and Nubbins, Grandpa, er, Grandpa? There's also this guy. Verna says that he's a pig thief, and Drayton force feeds him some of their meat cake. But when they give Jed his birthday gift and cheer him on to chainsaw the stranger, Jed just can't bring himself to do it. You let us down, Jed. Yeah, better get Grandpa to do it. He is the best at Oh, holy shit. He really is the best at killing here. Wow, it's like seeing a legend brought to life, isn't it? It's 1955 in the Lone Star State, and young couple Betty and Teddy are getting hot and heavy on the road. I was really hoping they were driving a Chevy so I could rhyme again, but they're not. It's a Ford. They nearly hit something during their makeout sesh, and after pulling over to check it out, Betty sees it was a bovine boy. It's just a kid. Slash cow hybrid, nothing out of the ordinary. The kid asks for help and runs off through the field, so Good Samaritan Betty follows him all the way to the the Sawyer Farm, so we can recreate that famous Pam shot one more time for the people in the back. The barn she enters is full of bone decor and booby traps that drop her down through the floor. Oh no, what'd you do, you little cowboy? You done good, Jed. Well, you know what, Drayton? I think you and I have different definitions of good, because this just seems tragic to me. Drayton directs Jedediah to watch as Nubbins kills Betty by dropping a car engine on her. Notice that her full name is Betty Hartman? Might that be ringing a bell, dear viewer? It should since Bert Hartman was the mob leader turned evil mayor in the last movie, and Betty here would have been his sister. I guess this helps explain his anger towards the Sawyers in Chainsaw 3D. Bert and Betty's father is Hal Hartman, who's a Texas Ranger in this film, and he is also righteously pissed at the Sawyers since they just murdered his daughter with a car engine. Although Hal can't do exactly what he wants to right now, namely blow Drayton's friggin' brains out, he can take Jedediah and any other Sawyer children away from Verna. It's called Child Endangerment. You take one of mine, and I'll take all yours, Verna. Ten years later, we're at the Gorman House Reform Institution for Youths, where all the kids living here have had their names changed to protect them from their dangerous families. New nurse Lizzie is still learning the ropes from her higher-ups and meeting the patients she'll be overseeing. Among them are Bud, a strong silent type played by Sam Coleman, aka Young Friggin' Hodor, Jackson, a handsome young lad who seems relatively well-adjusted, and Ike, a super aggro dude who will only grow more dangerous as the movie goes on. In the bathroom, Lizzie also meets a female inmate named Clarice, another big old bully whose idea of a good time is making other inmates suck rats. Oh, wet little buddy. Clarice Clarice is a pyro whose character was originally inspired by Chop Top, since he doesn't exist in this timeline. She ended up being a more unique character, thanks largely to Jessica Madsen's performance, but don't worry, she's still crazy scary. We'll see plenty of that later on. Dr. Lang, the head doctor at the Gorman House, has a delayed meeting with a bow-tied lawyer in his office. Barry Farnsworth, we've been here an hour. Wait, you're telling me this dude grows up to be Richard Real? Yeah, I, uh, don't see it, but whatever, I guess. It's a movie. As we all know from the last movie, Farnsworth is the lawyer for Verna Sawyer. It's Mrs. Carson now. 
Oh, Verna Carson, that's right. Verna has married that Carson guy by now, and with his money and influence, she's been able to secure a court injunction that says she's allowed to see her son Jedediah. But Dr. Lang stonewalls her by saying that since all the kids have been renamed, they'd have to acquire certain records to see which kid is him. And that requires an entirely different court order. Another hope strangled to death by red tape. Verna excuses herself to the restroom and sneaks off on her own to cause a little mischief. Wait, does accosting a nurse count as a little mischief? Or is that just assault? She breaks into the patient area and starts calling out for Jed, resulting in both alarms and nurses getting their bells rung. Verna is eventually booted out of the hospital by Dr. Lang, but the damage has already been done. The inmates are running wild and manage to escape the locked section of the reformery. The commotion interrupts an electroshock therapy session being administered to Bud, and while the guards are distracted, Bud breaks free and kills two of them, I think, by bashing their heads against the ground. I'm just assuming they're dead, since we never see them moving again. Work with me here, you know? And we get another victim for the kill count during this breakout, when we see Clarice strangling that other female inmate to death with her own braided hair. Bud goes to Dr. Lang's office, and it only takes one thwack to the face to get him mad enough to kill. He adds Dr. Lang to the count by beating the dude's head against a window repeatedly until it finally breaks through and he bleeds to death. I love how excited actor Sam Coleman gets when he talks about slamming the Dr. Lang dummy against a window. I got to smash it into a window quite violently quite a lot of times and there's blood pouring out and it and it moves just like a, a human being and it's like wow this is crazy. Also heads up for the next few minutes for any photosensitive viewers because there are about to be a lot of flashing lights since this prison break is getting all kinds of crazy. As if you couldn't tell from all the papers flying around and the random blowjobs against the wall. Wait what? Damn Mike and Clarice really? Right now? Lizzie and another nurse hide in a hallway ripped straight from Outlast but the nurse friend is quickly killed by another inmate who appears in the headache inducing flashes and murders her with a straight razor to the mouth. The killer inmate turns to Lizzie, but gets beaten down by Jackson out of nowhere. Jackson stomps him a whole bunch, and the dude gets pretty bloody, so whatever, I'll put him on the count, even though I'm not positive he was killed. Jackson helps Lizzie up, and together they run outside, where they're promptly taken captive by Ike and Clarice. The dangerous duo beats them, defeats them, and sticks them in the trunks so they can get the heck out of Gorman. On their way out, a random dude in a wheelchair is thrown from an upper story window, so I'll just go ahead and put him on the kill count too. Ike picks up Bud in their stolen car, and after making everyone change their clothes, Ike tells Lizzie, Jackson, and Bud that they're going down to Mexico. And if any one of them tries to run, why well, he'll just go ahead and kill the others. The next day, they crest a hill and find a barbecue place. And since they're awful hungry, and since barbecue doesn't equal people meat yet, they make Bud stay outside while the others grab some chow. Jackson and Lizzie sit there, looking like Baby and Deborah, and he laments that they're not just regular kids on a date, kind of like how Clarice and Ike are acting. But those two firebrands can't stay innocent and giggly for long. Let's start some shit out. In the span of a few seconds, they go full on Mickey and Mallory killing three people in quick succession with one knife to the neck and two gunshots to the head. While they rob the place's patrons, Lizzie tries to make a run for it, but she's stopped by Bud. She's not the door, dude. You don't need to hold her like that. At least she made it outside, though, so she doesn't have to witness the last diner kill. This helpless waitress who was killed in cold blood by Ike with a shotgun. Wow, these Bonnie and Clyde wannabes fucking suck. They finally get out of there, but as they leave, a beaten down diner patron shoots Bud in the side. Later on, on, the kids abandon their stolen car and walk through the woods until they find a trailer they can take over. Lucky for them, it looks pretty abandoned. Man, couldn't you just kiss the guy who left this here for- Oh, ew, I didn't mean for real, Lizzie. Gross. I know I haven't been putting dead bodies on the count in this series, but just to drive home how much the rules really don't matter, I will put this one on the list. We're who's lining up in here, motherfuckers? Lizzie and Jackson tend to bud in his gunshot wound, and that night, while the two of them drink old moonshine, we see just how burnt Clarice's body is, and how kinky her sexual proclivities are. Damn, first cannibalism and now some light necrophilia? You nasty, Texas Chainsaw series. You nasty. Even later that night, Lizzie tries to get away again, and after Ike stops her, he yells at Bud for being a bad lookout. You're an idiot and a fool, and I don't know why God bothered to make you. Now get away from me. 
Harsh words, dude. And you know what? You're not such a good lookout yourself. Otherwise, you might have seen Bud coming from behind to knock you the fuck out. Bud drags Ike to a killing spot and enacts his revenge with some serious brutality. He fucking curb stomps him. Wow! What is this? Texan History X? Throughout all this, the kids and their trail of bodies have been followed by Ranger Hal Hartman and this dude Deputy Sorrell, who's played by another Game of Thrones alumni, Finn Jones. Wait a minute, is that a crime scene we can take pictures of? Huh, even with that, this movie still doesn't feel like it's part of the Texas Chainsaw series. The law enforcement officers eventually find Clarice in the woods, where Sorrells holds her at gunpoint and disarms her. Not in the, like, Leatherface in the remake kind of way, he just takes her guns away. Hartman arrives and beats her down, then tortures her, trying to find out where the others are. And if you think that's bad, just wait until she mentions his dead daughter. You're just a sad old man, crying over a stupid dead little girl. Oh, fuck, dude, you are definitely not supposed to do that. She didn't get, like, her phone call or nothing. Lizzie Jackson and Bud see the execution from afar and start to run away from scary-ass Ranger Hartman. When they hear police dogs are coming, they get the brilliant idea to, wait, hide inside a dead frickin' cow? I know I asked this last episode, but what is this, The Revenant? Also, if you'll allow me to repeat one more joke, I bet they thought it smelled bad on the outside. Mostly, though, I'm sitting here wondering how three human beings, one of them Bud, fit inside a single cow carcass. Sorry, I just can't suspend my disbelief quite that much. The bloody trio walks through more fields, feels like that's what half this fucking movie is, before Lizzie sees another cop and tries to flag him down for help. For some reason, Bud is the one who approaches the cop first, and he winds up getting shot again for his troubles. He tries to wrestle the cop to the ground, but that just turns him a headshot. Yep, Bud just died, y'all, courtesy of this random cop. And I bet you were sitting there the whole time thinking he was Leatherface, huh? Enraged over over his friend's death, Jackson attacks the cop and bloodies him up with his fists before taking a car door to the dude's head and killing him with a bunch of slams and one ultimate stop. Lizzie tries to drive away, but Jackson hops in the car and berates her for getting the cop's attention and thus getting Bud killed. You fuck everybody else. You fucking liar! Oh man, Lizzie, this really sucks. And it gets worse when Hartman shows up and starts shooting at him. One of his bullets goes through the side of Jackson's face, permanently disfiguring him, and when another hits Lizzie, she crashes the cop car in a huge vehicle stunt flippy crash, putting an end to their final flea attempt. Lizzie wakes up handcuffed in Hartman's cop car and grabs his police radio when she hears Deputy Sorrell's on the other end. She tells him who she is, and he responds sounding like Deputy Justin Timberlake. Where you at, girl? Let me save you, girl. She says she's at a barn before she's yanked out of the car by Hartman and then taken inside where he lays bare this movie's big twist. Jackson? There is no Jackson, honey. It's Jed. Jedediah Sawyer. Now, listen, I love a good twist, but this one seems so forced when you have a character like Bud who could believably grow up to be Leatherface and you swerve on us to say that Jackson grew up to be Leatherface instead. You're telling me Leatherface once successfully flirted with a cute nurse? Is there a reason you keep saying my name like that? I reckon I might like how it sounds as old. Get the fuck out of here. We all know how Leatherface is with women. How good are you? Deputy Sorrells goes to the Sawyer house because I guess he's been feeding Verna information for cash? I don't really know what this side plot is doing here, but he tells her that Hartman's got Jed at the barn before he's tricked and murdered by those dirty, dirty Sawyers. First he gets stabbed a whole bunch by Drayton, and then Drayton and Nubbins throw him into a pig pen where he's ultimately eaten to death by pigs. Damn, I knew pigs would eat flesh and bone, but they also eat iron fists? You crazy pigs! Hartman's all ready to enact revenge on Jedediah, who once helped kill his daughter Betty in this very barn. But right as he's getting started with it, Verna and her pack of Sawyer show up, and they stop Hartman by beating him to the ground. Back at the Sawyer house, Verna stitches up Jedediah's face. Don't worry, kid, you're gonna end up really owning this look. I mean, maybe not the muzzle, but one day you'll have faces to wear. Lizzie and Hartman wake up together in the Sawyer house, and although they try just walking out of this bone-filled house of horrors, they're stopped before they can make it through the front door. You messed with the wrong family. Verna calls Jed upstairs, and to actor Sam Strike's credit, he does a pretty damn good job replicating the movement and attitude of OG Leatherface. He actually makes the transformation and that twist somewhat believable, especially when, urged on by his mother, he revs up the chainsaw and murders Hartman with it. He puts the chainsaw in Hartman's chest and mulches it until Hartman's heart and other organs are a fine dust of red. Don't fuck with chainsaws, y'all. Lizzie breaks free and makes a run for it, surprisingly using the front door instead of a window. Maybe that's why they started locking 
attacking it later on. The Sawyers all run after her and chase her through the misty forest, looking like the Gogans trying to get their favorite orphan back. To be fair, the Sawyers probably do have the happiest home in these hills. Lizzie is ultimately chased down by Jedediah, who does the Leatherface limp after her until she gets caught in a bear trap. You know, now that I think of it, I don't know if I've ever seen a bear in a bear trap. It's always sexy teens for some reason. Lizzie pleads with Jedediah not to kill her, and her words start to get through to him, until... This isn't you! It's your crazy mother! Oh, holy goddamn! He just cut her freaking head off! Wow, it's an unexpected death for the final girl, but I guess that's what you get when you shit talk a Sawyer in front of Leatherface. The next morning is a peaceful one on the Sawyer farm. Verna gets rid of extraneous clothing in a trash can fire, the oldest Sawyer bros get rid of extraneous human meat by feeding it to pigs, and Grandpa takes a porch nap. He is the best at napping. The movie ends down in the basement, where Jedediah completes his transformation into Leatherface by sewing together and subsequently wearing a skin mask made of Lizzie's face. Oh, and making it purdy too. You've got such style, Leatherface. How many kills did we witness as Jedediah dematured into Leatherface? Let's chainsaw dance over to the numbers to find out. <laughs> 21 people died in Leatherface, the most of the entire series. The victims consisted of 15 men and 6 women, a more than 2 to 1 ratio of dudes, and with a runtime of 88 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 4.19 minutes. Not bad. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Lizzie. It's so sudden and a little bit surprising given her final girl status. It also helps that it was a chainsaw kill. Dull machete for lamest hmm. kill will go to the guards that Bud beats up in the electroshock therapy room. He just punched them to death. That's no fun. And that's it. Leatherface came out in 2017, but the rights to the franchise have changed hands since then, and there are rumors of a Leatherface, Freddy, and Jason crossover if certain distribution and acquisition deals get made. Personally, I wouldn't hold my breath for it, but whether or not it happens, I'm James A. Janice, and this has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Victor Anker Alexanderson, Masia, aka Jay Perkins, Pat Russell, and Brian McCallahan. We're done with another franchise, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre motherfuckers! What do you think about this series? Did I do it justice in the kill count? And another reminder that the first ever Dead Meat Live show will be at RTX in Austin, Texas on Sunday, July 7th. Thanks everyone, be good people.